Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Joanna Cardenas, an editor at Coquila Penguin Young Readers. Um, thank you to the students and teachers tuning into the Latinx Kidlet Book Festival all over the country. Um, I'm joined by authors Celia C. Perez, David Bowles, Diana Lopez, and Stephanie Rodriguez, um, who are here to talk about their new and forthcoming books. And they, they have a few things in common. So all of the books are middle grade. All of the books are published by Coquila. And I had the pleasure of working with each author on their book. Um, and this is just a quick PSA to all of the students tuning in that um, editing is just one of the many jobs that you could do in book publishing if you are interested in reading. Um, so just want to put that out there. But this discussion will also celebrate the exciting range of storytelling happening here. So we have poetry, we have a graphic novel, we have fantasy, love stories, stories about monstros, stories about luchadores, artists, musicians, best friends. Um, and our goal today is to make you want to read all of these books as soon as possible if you haven't already. Please read our anti-harassment policy in the chat box. And don't forget to subscribe, subscribe to the Latinx Kidlet Book Festival's YouTube channel. And if you are a school, classroom, librarian, or educator joining us, please enter our classroom book set giveaway. So authors, I'll suggest someone to start off each question, but everyone should feel free to jump in after that. Um, so if someone says something that you want to follow up on, please do. Um, and no pressure to answer every question. Let's just keep it organic and fluid. Um, so to start us off, can you give a one-line description, a the title of your book, a one-line description of the synopsis? That way we all have um, a shared foundation that we can build on for this conversation. Um, and why don't we start with Celia? Hi, everyone. I'm Celia Perez, and I am the author of Tumble, which you see behind me. And Tumble is a story of 12-year-old Adela Ramirez, whose stepfather has made a life-changing proposal. And this proposal sends her on a journey into her past and into the world of Lucha Libre. Great. David, how about you? Oh, yes. Hey, I'm David Bowles, um, and I'm the author of They Call Her Fregona, which is a follow-up to my book, They Call Me Guero, and it focuses on the, the uh, relationship between Guero Casas and Joanna La Fregona Padilla. Um, and in the midst of this really sweet, you know, first love um, in middle school, something kind of tragic happens to Joanna's family and Guero tries to help her deal with it and ultimately has to learn that sometimes all you can do to help people is to be there for them. Diana, how about you? Uh, I'm Diana Lopez, and I'm the author of Los Monstros, Feliz and the Wailing Woman. I just got my copies last night. <laughs> uh, Yay, and you're story, waiting for those. <laughs> yeah, it's a story of, uh, of a young girl who discovers that she is the daughter of La Llorona and goes on a journey to, to meet her mother and, and hopefully uh, cure her of, of, of her curse. And so there's a lot of magical, a lot of family elements in it. <laughs> And Stephanie. Hi, my name is Stephanie Rodriguez. Uh, my book is called Doodles from the Boogie Down. It follows my character, Steph, who's based on me in the eighth grade, uh, applying for a high school in New York City when she finds a uh, LaGuardia uh, High School, which is a specialized art school. And it's, oh, sorry, <laughs> trying to get it ready for the recording. Um, she wants to apply for LaGuardia High School, which is a school for the arts, but is also battling her very strict mom and uh, changing friendships. I hope that's okay, sorry. That's great, thank you. Um, so to start us off, like all, all of your books have a very strong sense of place. And I wanna spend a little bit of time talking about that first. For instance, David, you're bringing a real place to life in your book as it exists now. Stephanie, you're describing a real place as it was in 1999. Um, Diana, you're drawing inspiration from real, real places to create a fictional town with some fantasy elements. And Celia, I know you did a lot of research um, to create a fictional town that's based on, on real towns. So let's talk about place and the role that it plays in your stories. Um, and maybe what surprised you while you were working on, on developing the setting. And why don't we start with Diana? Um, you know, my book is set in a fictional town called Tres, 
Leches, the sweetest place in Texas. <laughs> uh, and it is a fictional town. It's, com it's completely out of my imagination. Uh, but I was inspired by a real place. So when I go from Corpus Christi to the Rio Grande Valley, there's a little road. It's, maybe David's familiar with it. It's 285, and it's between Riviera and Falfurias. And there's nothing spectacular about this road. It's a pretty straight it's a well-paved road, um, but there's a lot of ranches on either side of it and a lot of like roads to these ranches with these gates. And um, as I drive along this road, it's like I always want to turn left. I always want to turn south and I always want to go see what's over there. So when I was writing the book, it just felt to me um, because it has fantasy elements. I couldn't set it in my hometown of Corpus Christi because Corpus Christi feels too real to me. Uh, so I kind of uh, imagine that I did turn south uh, off of 285, and I just went from there. Like, what did I? What did I see? What did I smell? What did I hear? And so my book is filled with a lot of the um, landscape elements that you'll see in South Texas: the blue bonnets, the mesquite trees, the anaqua trees, the wisaches, uh, but also the foods of South Texas. Um, the main street is lined with bakeries and you can smell all that sweetness. Uh, and so I, and, and the animals of South Texas. So I tried to like bring in real world elements, but kind of put a fictional, I mean, a, a, a fantasy twist on them. Uh, maybe someday I'll turn south along 285 and go see what's really there. <laughs> and who knows, maybe Tres Leches is there. <laughs> <laughs> Hidden by a magical barrier. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, David, I saw you nodding quite a bit um, because you're you're very familiar with the area. Did you want to jump in? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I also live in South Texas, a couple of hours south of of Diana. And um, when I wrote the first book, uh, the first uh, Border Kids poem book, I was a little bit. I, I, I try to be a little bit vague, but like definitely in this book is doubled down and just describing my home, the, well, the town I live in, Donna, I guess my hometown is McAllen, but I've lived here for 25 years um, it, because it made it a lot easier to describe where people were and like use the names of actual restaurants and um, as kind of like a treat also for like kids and Donna. So when they read the book, they'll be like, oh, I go to that taqueria. I know that. Um, but one of the things that really surprised me in using this little town that's right on the border, it's, it's literally five minutes from its uh, sister city of Rio Bravo on the other side of the bridge, um, was that even though I think of Dana as being a really united place where people kind of like come together and, you know, we're almost all Mexican-American and we, you know, we share like similar like hopes and dreams for our children and stuff like that. Um, as I began to to talk to people and try to figure out how the events in the book would play out in the real world if they were to happen, um, I realized that there were all these divides and divisions and that there were um, kind of like two different sides to the town um, in terms of like the way they feel about immigration, especially. Um, and those were things I hadn't really thought about because we ha there are a lot of immigrants living in our town, um, a lot of undocumented people living in our town. And um, to find out that there are so many people in the, the town that are actually kind of opposed to them, um, even though perhaps, you know, like their jobs depend on there being all these citizens in town and so forth, um, was really surprising to me. And so it, it, uh, it, it, it layered all this richness in my story because whereas in the first book, Huero Casas is all... Um, about celebrating his town and, and, and so forth. And the second one, he he he, he discovers just like me, all these cracks beneath the surface, and and the town becomes really very divided. And I think that's an important lesson for for people to learn that like even in a community where we seem to bind together around culture and language and and traditions or whatever, we can disagree on things. And sometimes those disagreements can be really really big. Um, and so there's a lot of disagreement and a lot of fights in this book, fights between family members, like arguments, not like physical fist fights or anything like that. Um, uh, and uh, I think that's an important thing to, to explore. We tend to sometimes want to to look at our families and our communities through like uh, rose tinted glasses. But young people know the truth. Young people know that it's hard sometimes to be, you know, 
Gen Z, Gen Alpha, and have slightly different views about the way people should move through the world than than your, the elders in your your community and like the friction that comes as a result. And I wanted to honor that and show how adults can learn from young people as well and, and how those divides can be healed if we listen to one another. I love what you're saying about seeing a place that you've grown up in and that you're very familiar with kind of in a new way as you're starting to discover more things about the world and about yourself. And I feel like that's definitely applicable to Stephanie as well, or to Steph in, in Doodles from the Boogie Down. Um, and it kind of got me thinking about how all of your books in some way, your characters are kind of dealing with um, expectation versus reality. And in other words, to say, you know, what you think something's about versus like how it actually feels in experience. Um, and, and for Steph, for instance, the, Steph, the character um, has this idea of like where art lives or like what it means or how you go about being a quote unquote real artist. And the actual experience that she has is kind of different. And Stephanie, do you want to talk a little bit about how your character works through expectation versus reality? Sure. Um, basically, Steph uh, uh, is an artist, um, doesn't really know what to do with that. Like, what does a career in the arts look looks like? Because um, she doesn't have anyone in her family or anyone in her close community that has that that does that as a uh, career. Um, and uh, her art teacher kind of introduces her uh, to the art world by taking her to museums and galleries and, and, and exposing her to this world. Um, but while they're doing that, she's kind of taking her out of the Bronx and into um, Manhattan, which is the center of New York City where everything's happening. And somehow in Steph's mind, she kind of thinks like, wow, okay, so art lives here. I have to travel to this place to see art. Um, but as the book goes on, she kind of slowly, slowly learns that that's actually not the case. And there's actually a lot of art that's already within her neighborhood that she's going to discover as the book goes on. And, um, and yeah, and it's like a, a really beautiful thing to see. Uh, you know, she's uh, in the eighth grade, so uh, she doesn't really, she know, she thinks she knows everything. But like, as the book goes along, she starts to learn, okay, like the world is actually a lot bigger and uh, it's not just one way. Yeah, there's like an element of discovery for her as she starts to learn about like these artists in the Bronx and these places where living art is mm -hmm. because art doesn't always have to belong in museums. It can be like out on a mural um, right. and that's like a really beautiful part of the book. And it kind of reminds me of um, Addie in Tumble and the way that like she's got a whole journey of discovery as well. She's like a, a sleuth in her own right knows how to like go to the archives and look stuff up. Celia, do you want to talk a little bit about kind of expectation versus reality for Addie as she's kind of on her journey? Yeah. And I love nosy kids. <laughs> yes. So, um, nosy kids. <laughs> yeah. So Addie, um, Addie, so Addie's grappling with, uh, with this idea of like what makes a family and, and more specifically for, for her, um, what it means to, um, to what is a father, like what it means to, to have a father, what a father should be in her life. Um, she's grown up knowing that families don't all look the same. Uh, but at the same time, she can't help wondering what it would be like to have um, what she, you know, she, this image of like a nuclear traditional family um, that you see a lot. And um, I think at the start of the story, she doesn't really have a clear idea of, of like what she's expecting or what those things are going to look like for her. And that's, that's really what, what the journey is for her is, is um, trying to figure out, or first of all, trying to realizing that those things don't mean the same thing for everyone and trying to figure out what they mean for her specifically. What is her family? What does her family look like? Um, and and who who is a father in her life who plays that role? Um, so a lot of that of her story is just kind of grappling with those with those two concepts and, and trying to define them for herself. And she's a kid who's into science. She's really like always into these kind of quirky science facts. And so um, she tends to think of, you know, family and, and a father in biological terms. And um, and that's something else that she has to like come to terms with that. That's not that biology doesn't necessarily make family or fathers or mothers and um, so there's a lot of just, um, 
I think awakening for her and and I think as with all the characters in my books defining defining what things mean and um, and being okay with them not meaning what they may be for other people. Absolutely. And Diana, do you want to talk a little bit about um, Felice and sort of like the things that she expects at the beginning of the story and how that maybe changes? Well, one of the, one of the things that um, when, when she finds out that she's the daughter of La Llorona, who's a ghost that's haunting the rivers, uh, you know, she's always kind of missed her mother figure. And, and she's really excited about meeting her mother. And she's, you know, she thinks it's going to be this great reunion and going to be able to save her mother real easily. And, you know, and, and when she does meet her, she realizes that, um, you know, it's not that simple. You know, uh, you know, her mother has her mother's kind of existing in between worlds and it's it's not always possible to get what you want i don't want to spoil the ending but yeah, you know but anyway that's uh and i think that happens a lot of times we uh as young even older people you know we're about to meet someone and we do have a, a lot of high expectations of that meeting we imagine what it's going to be like we might even rehearse what we're going to say before we meet them uh, and then, and then we're there, and it's not exactly what we expected. It's a little bit different, and we kind of have to, on the spot, adjust how we're feeling. <laughs> For sure, and I would say that definitely applies across age, across ages. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so another connecting thread um, that I see in your stories. Um, is a concept that's specifically named in David's book, um, they call her Fregona, this idea of cosas de adultos. So the idea that there are topics that are for adults only to discuss, not for kids. Um, yeah. How do your books reckon with this? And David, since you name it specifically, do you want to start us off? Sure. I mean, this was the way it was when I was a kid. Um, and it's something that I actually tried not to do with my own children. And it's this notion that you know, kids can't handle certain things and that we're going to have some discussions that kids don't need to be privy to. And I mean, uh, clearly there are some things that adults want to talk about that kids shouldn't be around for. But some, I think some grownups like take it too far and keep things from the kids because um, they think the kids' opinions don't matter, or the kids will be bored by it or like just what for, for whatever reason. And sometimes they put kids in an awkward position of uh, not knowing certain things about members of their community or members of their family that they should know to be able to protect themselves a little bit better and so forth. So, um, I mean, I, I think that, that it's a tough thing. It's a tough thing for kids who, who are having secrets kept from them. Um, and it's a tough thing for adults to figure out, you know, what should I be telling kids? And, but I think that when you trust your children, when you trust young people, um, and you tell them in a way that they can understand what's going on and like you listen to their advice. I, I think adults have a lot to learn from young people. I think young people have fresh perspectives uh, on situations and could be useful to finding solutions. Can I jump in here real quick? Um, Cause I want, I want to also say that, yeah, a lot of times when, when, when you write for kids uh, it is, it is scary as an author to bring some things up, you know, uh, but things do happen in life that are really difficult to talk about. You know, one of them being the, the death of a loved one. And sometimes uh, those are really hard conversations. Uh, but when I was growing up, I always found that uh, if I found a situation in a book, that was always a good way for me to kind of like start the conversation with my parents, you know. And this is why I love reading books and I, I love writing for young people because uh, you can ex you can meet other characters that might be going through what you're going through, and if it's something your parents haven't brought up yet, here's a way to say, "Can we talk about this?" You know, and um, and so thanks to all of my fellow writers too for bringing up those those challenging topics in your stories. <laughs> And I'll also add that uh, going back to the nosy kids that <laughs> kids, you know, kids tend to be more aware than adults give them credit for. They know a lot more um, than than often we um, we give credit for. And I think that's probably just adults putting on our own blinders because we want to keep 
um, you know, children in this protective bubble of innocence. Um, and when you are uh, kept in that bubble, what kids will often do is go off and search for that information themselves and sometimes find information that is good and sometimes find things that are maybe not not the best um, information for them to know or have. And so, you know, having those conversations, um, like David and Deanna said, um, whether, you know, figuring out a way to do it um, through books, through stories, um, in, in a way that, um, that works for the age of the child is, I think, is really important. Um, I guess I'll also chime in uh, for Steph from, um, from Doodles. Um, so in, in my book, um, Steph's mom has kind of a negative thoughts about public schools, specifically um, in the Bronx, um, and has put Steph in a private Catholic school for most of her uh, schooling. Um, and now that Steph's a little bit older and she finds out about a school that she wants to go to that happens to be a public school, it kind of brings up her questioning her mom as like, why, why do you have this rule? Like, what is it? Um, and her mom's not really ready to have that kind of relationship with her where they are open and she can uh, kind of open up about her experiences and why she has that she made that decision a long time ago. Um, and then we, we kind of see them kind of going kind of back and forth um, until a pivotal moment happens where the, they kind of have to sit down and talk about it. Um, so yeah, I, my book also deals with like, you know, you're the kid, I'm the parent. Um, and I don't have to explain these things to you. No is no. And that's it. Um, but then we find out that there's other ways to communicate with um, between parent and child where it's healthy. And uh, everyone kind of understands each other at the end. Yeah, so I think that's a really good point of like these kind of rules that some parents have of of like no is no and that's the end of the discussion. And I think the thing that is so lovely about your books is that there is a discussion that follows. And it even, you know, takes it a step further, um, which is another connecting thread that I that I want to bring up that I feel is really lovely and really resonated with me in all of your books is that the young people in your books hear I'm sorry from the adults in their lives. And I'd love to spend a little bit of time talking about these scenes in your books and why you felt it was important to include them. Let's start with Celia. Um, yeah, so hearing I'm sorry is definitely not something that I, <laughs> that I, that I heard from the adults in my life when I was a kid um, and something that I, you know, even as, a, as an adult, I think I really would like to hear or would have liked to have heard. Um, I think, you know, hearing, hearing, I'm sorry, and, and recognizing that, um, that adults make mistakes, and that adults are not always right is really important for kids, I think, in their own development, as they're growing up, especially at the age that we are writing for. Um, I like to include that in the story, I, I always feel like I write from the child's point of view. So when kids ask me, who, who are you in the book? Or are you in the book? I'm both the, the child protagonist, but I'm, I feel like I'm also the adult, because I'm able to see um, both sides of, of what, you know, what that experience is like. Um, uh, I don't know, I guess, as an adult, I'm always thinking back to the kinds of things that, that make me who I am, that still kind of resonate and affect who I am. And, and I see like the behaviors and the things that I picked up from the adults when I was growing up. Um, and sometimes they're good things. And sometimes they're things that are not that good. <laughs> um, and I like to believe that like with each generation, we're making progress and we're doing better and we're, we know more. And so we do better. Um, and, and one of those things that we're hopefully doing better is uh, treating and how we treat children and how we communicate with children and behave with children. Um, I think admitting that you're wrong is one of the first steps in breaking like really harmful patterns. And, and I think, um, uh, I think it's important for kids to be able to, to recognize that the adults don't have all the answers and that they do make mistakes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the one, the specific scene in my book where an adult like literally says the word, sorry to, to a young person, all oh, there's, there's a lot of implicit apologizing is when, um, Joanna's father calls her and she's she has him on speakerphone and Wedo is with her and he starts telling Wedo, make sure that my daughter does this, that, that, and the other thing. And she's like, no, don't don't talk to him, don't tell him what to to make me do. Talk directly to me. I'm your daughter 
th these are things that I have uh, autonomy over. Uh, she doesn't use that word, but like that I have control over. Um, and I thought it was a great scene for him to say, I'm sorry, Mika, you're right. Perdón, you know, because it is, there is, a, I, I've noticed in my community a tendency that when um, a young woman starts dating uh, a boy, um, the father of the girl, once, once he accepts him, um, begins to like have this like like this relationship like hey the two of us were kind of like in control of the women and here's what I want you to do to take care of my daughter and um, and, and it kind of robs the the girl of autonomy and I, so I wanted to 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 make a statement about that and it's one that I cheered for when I got to that scene when I got to that poem I was like yes more of this please <laughs> yeah that's literally probably one of your notes more of this please. <laughs> Um, Diana, I saw you jump off off of mute for a second. Did you want to add something? I was just going to say that th this moment of of, of apology um, between a parent and a child, you know, and one one is we say sorry. A lot of times we say it for ourselves because we we need to forgive ourselves for you know um, for whatever it is we're apologizing for. But I, I also think that it's a real touching moment of vulnerability. And I think that, uh, you know, when I was growing up, it was really difficult for my um, parents to show that that they were vulnerable, that maybe they didn't know what they were doing. And, and I think there was, it was just um, a, a generational thing like that, that, that that vulnerability was a signal of weakness. But I think now, now, um, vulnerability is a, a, a symbol of strength and people see it that way. Uh, and so I love those moments between parents and children because it just shows uh, a parent who's willing to show, to admit that they're wrong, that maybe they didn't know what they were doing or they made a mistake um, is really giving, is really empowering their child. Um, you know, not just because they're, you know, they're asking for forgiveness, but they're showing that child that, um, we're, it's it's human. We're not you know perfect, and it's okay. Uh, so that's what I wanted to add. <laughs> and Stephanie, if there's anything you wanted to add um, before we, I think we have time for one more question. Sure. Um, yeah, in my book, I I also well, Steph also deals with um, a mother who doesn't know how to say I'm sorry, um, and also because of the dy dynamic of like, she knows that uh, when her mom says no, it means no. So she doesn't really question that, but uh, we see her grow throughout the book and um, she becomes more curious, um, especially because she just doesn't understand like why, why is this rule such a big rule for her? Um, and a lot of times um, our parents make up these rules and the way things are because they've gone through something that deeply hurt them and they're trying to protect their children. Um, and it's kind of hard for kids to uh, kind of understand that their parents also can be heard and play certain rules to protect them. Um, but I guess that's, what's, oh, that's why it's important to have these I'm sorry more moments in, in uh, our books, uh, just to show that we can learn from our parents' experiences. And then our parents can also feel um, comfortable with uh, answering some of our questions and um, you know, as someone mentioned earlier, I think it was David that kids uh, or say, yeah, the kids are really smart and um, they'll understand like uh, topics that parents might think are a little uh, difficult for, uh, their, for, the, for them to understand. Um, yeah. And that scene in your book is so powerful because there's like a two way exchange happening. Um, yes, Stephanie understands a little bit more about her mom's perspective, but also her mom has some pretty big like aha moments thanks to Stephanie like having the space to share or Steph having the space to share about her own experience in a way that she hasn't before. Um, so that's that's really powerful. Um, so I think we have time. Uh, let's see um, for another question. One more question. And um, this one's about friends. We've talked a lot about family and we've talked a lot about parents. Um, so our communities also include our friends and our neighbors. Um, and I'd love to talk a little bit about um, how your characters show up for their friends and how they're supported by their friends. Um, David, why don't we start with you? Yeah. So when um, Joanna is going through the, the really tough time when her family is like just trying to fight against 
um, the deportation of her father, spoiler alert, um, <laughs> the the friends around her, she's she's got a group of friends that are called Las Morras or Les Morres sometimes because she has a non-binary friend. And um, they kind of band together uh, behind her and each of them use the, their particular talents to try to, to promote the cause and to help, um, you know, raise funds and, and so forth uh, for the legal effort. And, and Guero and his group of friends, Los Babis, his fr three friends who are named Robert or, or Roberto, um, also do what they can. Although um, Guero, because he's just like a problem solver like his dad, um, just keeps going and going and going. And even as effort, effort, effort to, to change the situation you know, fails, he still is like determined to do something more. And, um, and I mean, it, it's good to have friends who help you out, but there's a point at which, um, you know, sometimes you need to tell your friends who are a little too over enthusiastic about helping you. Like that's, that's enough. Thank you. I, I've got it from here on out. <laughs> For sure. Knowing when to show up and also knowing that showing up can sometimes mean um, listening to what the other person actually needs. My story uh, it's, you know, it's all about making friends. And so, you know, because uh, my character goes to a new land, uh, she's kind of the stranger in the strange world and she doesn't know anybody. And so, uh, but luckily she meets some people and, and they're able to help her and she's able to help them. But, uh, you know, a lot of times I write books with characters that have established friendships. So this was a lot of fun to write a book with a character who's making new friends as the story progresses. Because as you're reading the book, it's like you're getting to know these other people as well and discovering what their special talents are, what their hangups are, you know, and, and uh, just kind of finding ways to connect with them and, you know, and to go on these adventures. So, yeah, friends come in all flavors. Some are, you know, our lifetime friends. We've known them forever. And some are brand new, and and just that process of discovery, I think, is so much fun. Uh, it's one of my favorite things about meeting people and getting to know them. So I wanted to kind of bring that into my story. <laughs> yeah, I had a lot of fun writing um, Addie's relationship with her best friend Sai. Um, they really show. Up, I feel like they really show up for each other in the in their times of needs. And at the beginning, Addie even. Um, says that Sai isn't just the best friend, she's like a sister. So she has this, um, you know, based on the relationships that she sees around her and her mother's friendships, um, she she has this, um, she does have this idea of friends being more than just friends, friends being family. Um, Sai is someone who helps her solve the mystery of her father. She's like, all right, let's do this. We're gonna figure out who he is. <laughs> and, um, and then in turn, Addie helps Sai with this really important project um, that's happening at school. And um, yeah, and I think Sai just, I mean, Addie really understands that that friends, um, you know, friends are like family. And you see that in her relationship with this new kid at school who is resisting friendships um, for his own, you know, reasons that she is just unclear on, but she just kind of keeps pushing because she's like, you need friends, <laughs> you need friends. And so that like becomes kind of a little bit of a mission for her is to befriend this person. Um, for my book, uh, Steph has uh, two really close friends uh, that she's known her whole life. Um, and in the eighth grade, uh, they have to uh, decide what high school they want to go to. And in this case, they can go to a local school or in New York City. There's so many schools that specialize in uh, particular topics. Uh, for Steph, that would be art. Um, and she discovers that her friends don't want to go to the same school. They want to go to completely different places. And it kind of just seems like everyone is um, splitting apart a little bit. Um, and uh, she really does struggle throughout the book to um, be supportive for her friends and um, and be there for them when they need her. There's a lot of uh, miscommunications that happen um, because she is a shy kid. And uh, if someone says something she finds hurtful, she really doesn't know how to uh, speak directly and ask why they said what they said. And it kind of is just a spiral of um, miscommunications and uh, between everyone until it just gets worse and worse and they have to end up talking about it. Um, which I feel like a lot of kids can relate to. Um, Cause uh, I mean, I, I'm not, I'm no longer a kid, but I'm, I am still learning how to um, yep. a properly with my friends and uh, be, be there for them when they need me. Um, and so I think um, she's, she's a, a very, a complex character that a lot of kids can relate to. 
And adults, yeah. Totally. Yes. Yes. Adults too. <laughs> yes. And I think you all summed it up really well that friends are kind of like a chosen family. Um, and they're, they can be in your life for a long time. They can be in your life for a moment. And both of those things are okay. Um, and also friends are, are, are folks who have varied interests and you don't always have to like the same thing, but have enough in common to connect. I think all of that is so, so true. Um, so let's move on to some questions from our audience. Uh, so let's, let's do that. Let's jump in. My question is, why did you choose to write for children? Oh, what a great question. I that question. Yeah. I was a, a teacher, a middle school teacher, and I had a group of kids um, in my third year of teaching that were just, they, they didn't like the textbook. They couldn't connect with it. They were kind of like struggling a little bit. A lot of them were like new to English. Um, and so what I started to do was um, to try to reach them using the stories that we had in common, like folk tales and so forth, and retelling those stories and written form of short stories for them. Um, and it went over really well. And I taught them to do the same thing. And and it was during that year that I was like, wow, it's writing for these kids is really fun and really rewarding. And I think that's what I want to do. And and just that set me on the path that I'm on today. I was going to say that my journey is very much like David's journey. I was a middle school teacher uh, for like almost 10 years. And um, that's why I love writing for middle school students. My students were always wanting stories about their families, their ways, their traditions. And, um, and there weren't very many, you know, available at the time. I'm so happy to say that there's quite a few available now uh, and more coming every, every year. But, uh, but really, I just write as kind of love letters to my past students. So I, I always think of myself as a reader before I think of myself as a writer. And when I think of my happiest memories as a reader, it's from when I was a kid, um, specifically when I was the ages that I write for. So I think there's a connection there. <laughs> um, I think I'm, I'm always in some ways writing for, um, for who I was when I was 10, 11, 12, and um, trying to write stories that uh, that I think I would have wanted to read. And so I think that's why um, why I write for kids. I also just love writing for this age group. I think it's just such a great, um, and I'm thinking like nine through 12, I think is probably what, you know, middle grade is kind of the target audience for. But um, it's I, I feel like it's such a perfect age because it's this really nice combination of like, um, just kind of hopeful and enthusiastic and like ready to change the world and also starting to think about how um, complicated the world is and that not everything is black and white. So I think it's, um, it's just like, just really fun to, to write to that, to that age group. I also agree that um, that age group is uh, so much fun to write for. Um, middle, middle school was a, uh, difficult and fun and i have a lot of uh memories from that time in my life and um i think it's a pivotal time in kids lives because uh, it's almost like well you're still a kid and you're kind of almost a teen but not really you're kind of like in between and trying to find your voice and starting to find things that you that you really like and are passionate about and, and want to focus on um and I just like writing stories about that time in my life because I feel like uh, a lot of kids can relate to that. Um, also, like I, I just like to draw, uh, draw and write stories that are, you know, kids that, that look like me because uh, I didn't really grow up watching uh, any sh uh, TV shows or reading any books that really had kids that grew up in a city like me or have my skin tone or my hair texture. So for me, it's really important to. Um, to kind of represent for those kids that um, maybe don't have anything right now that um, they can relate to in, in that kind of way. I love that. And so we have we have another video question. Let's go ahead and pull that up. Hi, my name is Evie, and I'd like to know um, what's your favorite character out of all the books you've written. This is a hard one. <laughs> It's always a hard one. Um, I think um, my favorite protagonist is probably 
Astor from Strange Birds. Um, <laughs> she's someone who I would like to spend more time with and kind of figure out, like, explore more of her world. Um, but I tend to kind of fall for the, like, secondary, like, the supporting characters in my stories. So in Tumble, I think that would be Maggie and Eva, who are um, Addie's twin cousins who are into wrestling. They're a little bit older than her and are into wrestling. And I, um, I'm always kind of curious about what else is going on in their lives when they're not at their grandparents' um, home. And then one that always sort of haunts me, she, sort, she just kind of appears every once in a while when I'm not expecting it. In, um, in Strange Birds, there is a younger character who has like maybe three scenes. Her name is Olive Padilla. <laughs> every once in a while, she just kind of appears. And I'm like, what is going on with Olive? <laughs> with Olive? Um, so yeah, so if you haven't read Strange Birds, check it out. Look for, Olive. <laughs> Look for Olive's appearances. <laughs> I want to plead the fifth. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> it's kind of like it's a question like oh, which which of your children is your yeah. favorite? Like, oh, <laughs> I mean, White Off for me feels like the easiest to write because, um, I mean, even though he's not completely autobiographical, he is he's about thirty percent autobiographical, and the other thirty percent is like taken from my son's life. So it, it's easier to write, and and so it it feels like putting on a really comfy pair of jeans or or well worn shoes or whatever to. To pop into his voice. Is everybody else pleading the fifth too? <laughs> no, I was a. Uh, I mean, the, I do have a character in my book called "Ask My Mood Ring How I Feel." The main character her name is Chia. I really connect to her. We have a lot, you know, in common. She's the oldest in her family, and um, she's kind of like saddled with a lot of babysitting duties. Her mom is sick, so she kind of becomes a second parent, you know, and. Uh, and, and and very much that's how that's kind of how I grew up with uh, with all my younger siblings. And I'm also the oldest grandchild on my mother's side, and I was the oldest grandchild who lived in Corpus on my dad's side. So I was always baby I was always babysitting. But in my newest book, I have a character named uh, Mayor Reynaldo, who is just he's so much fun. I mean, I love his speeches. I love. He drives a monster truck called El Cucuy. He carries a piñata stick, you know, as his like, um, you know, sign of authority. And he he was so much fun to write. It just I had a great time with him, and and uh, he he makes me laugh. And I, you gotta love a character who makes you laugh. Um, I guess for my book, I. I'm a little biased, but my main character stuff is based off of me as a kid. So I would say this is my favorite character um, just because uh, she's just a mixture of things. You know, she's shy, but she's also determined. Um, she also uh, just has a big heart. Um, other than stuff, uh, there's a lot of like fun characters in the book, um, her classmates, her friends. Um, there's one in particular, her name's Bianca, and she's her uh, art teacher's daughter who's a year older and already goes to the school that she's trying to get into. So she's kind of like yeah. what Stephanie would love to be. Uh, you know, she was just like not as shy and um, got to wear like edgy uh, emo kind of clothes. <laughs> <of that. laughs> um, because she's always in a Catholic school uniform and, and things like that. So um, I would love to kind of um, dive into her more in a, in another uh, book or some other opportunity because uh, she's, She's pretty cool. I completely agree. So we have one more question. This one doesn't have video. So what inspired you to make the characters? I would say just people from my community and from my own family and from my life, I just drew from them and blended them and um, just tried to create a world that would feel as lived in it and real as the one I live in. And that's one of the best ways to do that is through characters. Yeah. I was a I was when I was in middle school I was a big professional wrestling fan so so uh, I knew that I wanted to write a book about wrestling and I think just um, the memories of that time and reading back on my diary from those years and just remembering all the personalities um, that I was a fan of is what inspired this big cast of characters in Tumble. Well, mine started with just the, the what if question, you know, um, you know, but, but like, like David, a lot of, a lot of the characters I've written in my books are just, they're kind of composites of people I've known, um, you know, or just little details I see when I'm walking around. 
but for for my book, um, Feliz and the Wailing Woman, one day I was at the store and I was looking at purses and there was a happy face emoji purse. And I, I bought it and I just said, I just gotta have this purse. Uh, and it was before my character was really born, but I just thought, wouldn't it be cool if I had a character that was always carrying a happy face emoji purse? You know, and cause she's, she's pretty much happy. And then uh, La Llorona means wailing woman, someone who's always crying. And so I, I really just kind of like put those two emotions side by side. And, and that's where that character, um, you know, sometimes it's just an image that uh, really grabs you. It might be something that a character wears or, that a, or even an activity that a character enjoys. And, and they're just born from that, you know. And so um, I had a lot of fun in this book because I've got another character named Rooster, which I think he's really cool. He's got a really high pompadour. And, and then I have another character named Ava who has – feathers in her hair and she's very light sensitive so she wears these dark goggles and um they're just uh once you start opening your mind to writing stories you are going to see characters everywhere so those of you that want to be writers just just know that um uh characters are characters in fiction they're not really they're not real people but they can we can take little bits and pieces from the real people in our lives <laughs> Uh, for me, um, because my characters are, well, some of my characters are based on real people, like my mom, myself, my grandmother, but maybe just like edited just a little bit um, for story purposes. Um, some of the friends are inspired by uh, friends that I made through adulthood, and I kind of just uh, make them work with around Steph's personality. So maybe things that she isn't as strong at, at or is lacking. Uh, one friend's a little bit stronger and they can support each other in that way. Uh, Steph is, again, an artist, but she's not so... Her uh, math and science is like probably not her favorite subject, um, but her friends are always there to support her uh, when she needs the help. Um, so that, that's kind of like what I wanted to um, play around with the characters as like a way to kind of support stuff in different ways, but they have like their own personalities. And also um, because I'm an illustrator, um, personally, I feel like uh, clothing is super important to um, to show in, in my book because uh, it's also a part of um, uh, how each character expresses themselves. Um, you can kind of tell like what kind of music or what kind of uh, topics or things people are kind of into just by kind of how they express themselves with fashion. So um, that was also uh, very important to, to add, to build into um, each character's uh, personality. I love all of the fashion, all of the like 90s inspired um, fashion music, all of the references are so, so fun. So I hope, I hope y'all check that out. Um, so we're at the end of our time. This was such a great discussion. Thank you to Celia, David, Diana, Stephanie for sharing with us today. Thanks again to the teachers and students who sent in their questions. Um, we hope that you enjoyed this conversation too. And thank you to the Latinx Kidlet Festival organizers for bringing this dynamic program to life and to Penguin Young Readers for sponsoring this panel. Happy reading, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Judith from Penguin Young Readers. And today I'm here with Danielle Presley. Hi, everyone. To share some of our favorite books by Latinx and Hispanic creators. We have a lot of exciting titles to share with you, some that are available now and some publishing next spring. There's a lot to cover, so let's get started. All right, so we're gonna start off strong with our HQ graphic novel series. Um, this is a series that I am so excited about. The Kid Tested Biography series, Who Was Line, is now available as graphic novels, and this installment focuses on Mexican-American labor leader and civil rights activist, Cesar Chavez. This is a story of hope, solidarity, and perseverance that will invite readers to immerse themselves in this pivotal point in history, brought to life by a gripping narrative and vivid full color illustrations that jump off the page. So we are so thrilled to share the companion to the New York Times bestselling The Day You Begin, The Year We Learned to Fly, written by Jacqueline Woodson and illustrated by Rafael Lopez, and the Spanish edition simultaneously pubbed and is available. So in this beautiful book, a brother and sister use techniques taught to them by their grandmother to use their imaginations to help them manage 
so many different things in their life, boredom, anger, and frustration. She calls it learning to fly. And if this imagery reminds you of the book by Virginia Hamilton, they um, called The People Could Fly, that's intentional. In Virginia Hamilton's book of American Black Folk Tales, she tells the story of how enslaved people escaped their hard lives by lifting up and flying away from home. Jacqueline Woodson uses the same imagery to remind the brother and sister in this book of the power of these passed down stories. Uh, Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor has been called the people's justice and takes her role as an inspirational figure seriously. She has always done her part to build a better world and a better community through medicine, law, and children's literature. Just Ask was a favorite among our educators, and now you'll have another book to add to your collection with Just Help. Uh, Justice Sotomayor takes young readers on a journey through a neighborhood where friends and strangers all help one another to build a better world for themselves and their community. With art by award-winning illustrator Angela Dominguez, these, uh, this meaningful story shows how we can make the world better one action at a time by asking the question, who will you help today? Jenny Torres Sanchez is the author of multiple YA novels, inc including the Pura Bell Prey honor, We Are Not From Here. And now the youngest readers will get to experience her beautiful and lush writing in her debut picture book, With Lots of Love. This lyrical story about a girl who moves from her home in Central America to the US, leaving everything behind, including her abuela, celebrates the special bonds of multi-generational love. With families experiencing more physical distance, now more than ever before, and given the immigration of Latinx individuals and the separation many are facing at the US-Mexico border, this story touches on the very real notion that love exists beyond borders. Diamond Park is a book that you won't be able to stop thinking or talking about. In short, it's about four Mexican-American teenagers from Houston, a 59 Chevy Impala, and a murder that changes their lives forever. Grappling with the themes of identity and gender, this book is perfect for readers of Matt de la Peña and Randy, Ru Randy Rube's Painted Saints of Nothing. The writer, Philippe, is the son of Haitian ex exiles and grew up in Mexico City. He's a recipient of the, of the Penn slash Phyllis Naylor Working Writer Fellowship, that's a long one, and author of two previ previous novels, including the acclaimed YA novel, Playing for the Devil's Fire, which is Yalso's best fiction for young adults pick another long one. I hope you all get to read this one. We are so excited to welcome Margarita Engel um, to our list. Singing with Elephants is a beautiful historical fiction novel in verse focusing on one girl and her quest to save a baby elephant in need. Cuban born 11 year old Oriole lives in Santa Barbara, California where she struggles to belong but most of the time that's okay because she enjoys helping her parents care for the many injured animals at their veterinary clinic. Then Gabriela Mistral, the first Latin American winner of the Nobel Prize in Literature, moves to town. An aspiring writer, Oriole, finds herself opening up. As she begins to create a world of words for herself, Oriole learns to take, um, to take courage to, uh, well, learns it will take courage to stay true to herself and do what she thinks is right, attempting to rescue a baby elephant in need, even if that means keeping secrets from those she loves. This is such a gorgeous story, um, story of friendship, standing up for those who don't have a voice and how poetry can be such a meaningful form of expression. This was a big year for us with two picture books from Jacqueline Woodson on our list. In The World Belonged to Us, she teams up with the magnificent and award-winning illustrator, Leo Espinoza. Um, this book celebrates the joy and freedom of summer in the city. It's both nostalgic and timely. It also celebrates children's budding independence, models leadership skills, and captures the sense of community in a diverse city neighborhood. The art is lively and free-spirited, and the text is evocative and rhythmic. This is bound to be one of the most celebrated, stocked, sold, borrowed, and read picture books of the year. And there's also a Spanish edition for this title available. Next up on the list is a sweet story from debut author Cynthia Harmony. A little girl and her dog embark on their daily walk through the city. They skip and spin to the familiar sounds of revving cars and friendly barks, but what they aren't expecting to hear is the terrifying, terrifying sound of a rumbling earthquake. And then silence. Cynthia was inspired by the devastating earthquakes that hit Mexico City in 1985 and 2017. 
She actually experienced one of these quakes and wanted to write a story that shows the courage and resilience of Mexico City. With captivating text and lively illustrations, this heartwarming story leaves readers with the message that they can choose to be strong and brave even when they're even when they're scared and can, can still find joy and hope in the midst of sadness. Now for my favorite book of the year, Tumble by Celia C. Perez. Celia is an author that we all know and love, and we're so lucky to be publishing her newest book about a 12 year old named Adela Ramirez, who has a big decision to make when her stepfather proposes adoption. Although, although Adela loves her stepfather, she has a million questions. The first being, who's her biological father? And why did he leave when she was a baby? And what would, and would she be able to meet him? This book features a smart protagonist, a peek at a cool subculture, Lucha Libre, and a vibrant ensemble cast. But what I really loved most about this book was Celia's ability to explore feelings that anyone at any range, at any age can connect to. This was such a reassuring and validating read. Next up is Chupa Carter by comedian and actor George Lopez alongside um, Ryan Calejo and illustrated by Santi um, Gutierrez. This start of a series is an illustrated contemporary fantasy starring 12 year old Jorge who is lonely and hates that he's been sent to live with his grandparents. Everything is going wrong on his first day of, at new school and what Jorge really needs is a friend. And it turns out the only kid who shares his interest in junk food and games is a young chupacabra named Carter. And being friends with a mythical creature should be amazing. But when local cattle turn up dead and his principal starts to suspect the truth, Jorge is torn. Should he trust that his friend is innocent and protect him from exposure or reveal his dangerous existence and change the world forever? And up next, we have the bittersweet story and verse companion to the Puro del Pre honor book, They Call Me Guero. They Call Her Fregona um, follows Guero and his budding romance with Joanna Padilla. Um, they call her Fregona because she's tough, always sticking up for others and keeping the school bully in check. But when they start eighth grade, um, Joanna faces a tragedy she's always feared. Her father is detained and deported to Mexico. In the story, Guero learns what it means to truly show up for someone you love. David Bowles lovingly captures the emotional complexity of the interior lives of young boys and explores the trauma that undocumented immigrants face every day. The constant fear that your mother, father, sibling, or yourself will be separated from the ones you love. This is a book you won't want to miss. This next book is a collaboration by two creators you might know. Newbery Medal winning author Matt de la Peña and New York Times bestselling critically acclaimed illustrator Karina Lukin. Patchwork explores the infinite possibilities each, each child can paint contains. You could be a dancer, a coder, a basketball player, a poet. You could be any of any and all of these things at every point in your life. This is an uplifting story with gorgeous artwork that tells young readers that your story is still being written. A must-have for every bookshelf. In my town, Mi Pueblo, two cousins live in two towns separated by a river. But there's always but there's also a bigger divide, the US-Mexico border, which means they live in different countries. On the girl's side, English is the main language, and on the boy's side, it's Spanish. Yet despite living in separate countries with different languages, the children have a world of things in common. This tribute to border towns is written as a bilingual mirror book. Each spread features the same scene on each side of the border, one side in English and one side in Spanish. This allows readers to not only explore the two vibrant cultures, but also introduces them to new vocabulary and develop fluency. This is perfect for Spanish slash English bilingual readers, as well as monolingual kids learning to, looking to learn, learn more. And lastly, we have A Seed in the Sun by Ayeda Salazar. Um, set just a few years after We Were the Fire, this book lives in 1965 and focuses on the rights of migrant workers. Lulu uh, Viramontes wants more than anything to not be invisible to be a person no one can ignore. She dreams of becoming a daring ringleader in a Mexican traveling circus. But as things become harder in her life from the, dangers, uh, from the dangerous working conditions during the grape harvest, to taking care of her mother who has fallen ill, to avoiding her father's volatile temper, Lulu finds that perhaps she needs um, to raise her voice sooner rather than later. Featuring real life labor rights activists, um, to, like real life, labor rights activists like Dolores Huerta, 
um, this powerful middle grade novel in verse is not one to be missed. And now to wrap us up, I just wanted to quickly mention a few titles that we have coming up um, at the beginning of next year. Hands by Tori Maldonado is a fast paced read that packs a punch about a boy figuring out how to best use his hands to build or to knock down. And this is coming in January. And then the next two are out in April. Felice and the Wailing Woman by Diana Lopez is about a 12, is about the 12 year old daughter of La, La Llorona, Llorona who vows to free her mother and reverse the curse um, that have plagued the magical town of Tres Leches. And then finally, Doodles from the Boogie Down by Stephanie Rodriguez is a debut graphic novel about a young Dominican girl um, as she navigates middle school, her strict mother, shifting friendships, and her dreams of becoming an artist. And finally, if you're looking for more books by Latinx and Hispanic creators, please check out our book list that you can find at the link listed on screen. We have a wide variety of titles, including front list and back list that span across all ages. And that's it from us today. Here's some info on where you can find us and make sure to check out penguinclassroom.com. We're updating the site constantly with materials for you to use, sneak peeks, videos, and more. Have a great day and enjoy the festival. Bye.